All right, I am, thanks. Um, I would like to talk a little bit about how we can hopefully generate open knowledge based on closed data and what kind of new deals are out there to make this happen. Small disclaimer in this perspective or in this, uh, in this regards is um, I will mention some companies later on that seem to have solutions uh, regarding this. I have no connections uh, here and I'm coming more from the perspective of the bioinformatician who well, uh, crunches a lot of data on a daily basis and um, enjoys doing this in the open, so as an um, open science enthusiast. And uh, John mentioned this already in, in the morning and he made the f uh, actually laid the foundation uh, for, for this talk in a way. In science, everything, data, source code, and clearly in the end the paper has to be open. Everything else would not be good scientific practice. I, I like to avoid the uh, word open science often because as John also already said, this is just pure science. That are foundations of our scientific process is openness. And uh, there's a small but. Whenever I give these workshops regarding open science and how we can implement this, somebody raises the hand and says, but. But, but, but. Well, there's sometimes data um, that is linked to personalities, that is linked to patients. So there is a higher good sometimes, which is called um, privacy. If I'm a patient, I have cancer, I would like maybe to de donate my, my, my genome data, for example, for research purposes. But what I do not want is that this is somehow linked to myself. And um, in principle, this is only one, one small example because we have a lot of data that we should share but maybe should not share because um, it has an uh, implication on how, how, we can, how we can live. So behavior data, everybody or many people have um, fitness trackers, for example, that track behavior or what am I eating. All these kind of things can be stored and can be used in science to, well, see general trends. So socioeconomical status is also something that in principle is, uh, can be a piece of research, so you can collect this data and try to make statements, scientific statements out of that. But as an individual, I, to be honest, would not like to have this in the hands of other people. Medical records, we just saw the example before by, by Dennis, uh, that you basically, sh Sharing this data can be useful for the research process, for, for researchers, but for the individual, um, this might be not so beneficial, at least uh, in, a, in, in, in a certain amount of time. And if we come to the core of ourselves, the genomes or exomes, or at least some SNPs, and these are maybe some biological expressions, but I think everybody's aware that we carry uh, basically the, the blueprint of our body in us and every cell. So the genome, uh, the DNA, is an important description of who we are and, and, well, how we develop and how we live. Today, we have actually technologies uh, making this easily accessible. This is one chart that you find very often. Um, the first human genome costed around 2.7 billion US dollars and took 10 years. And this was uh, then available roughly the draft in 2001. And when you then started to sequence a new genome, it just costed 100 million, <laughs> cheap in comparison. Today, and this is due to different technologies that um, arise roughly in the mid 2000s, um, today, I can sequence a genome in roughly one or two days for around, around $1,000. This is definitely a game changer. And I'm pretty sure many people are interested in having access to this data for their own um, purposes, for medical reasons, for example, in order to have personalized medicine. And this is a very powerful tool that will definitely change how we can do medicine and how we can do science. And then we are not only our body here, but we are actually an ecosystem and we're carrying a lot of bacteria in us. So the so-called microbiome, our gut microbiome, skin microbiome, all of this um, can be tracked today. Again, sequencing technologies are actually uh, helping here. And also this is saying something about me and also this can be something very interesting for researchers. 
And then you want, would like to even connect all this. So if you know how people behave or if you have um, certain, certain traits, how they are linked to the genome. This is then the inter interesting question that, for example, GBOS analysis can solve. So in, in principle, as a researcher, I have a lot of interest in this type of data. As an individual, I am actually not very interested in sharing this because this uh, gives a lot of um, yeah, um, weak points maybe to others. So scientifically speaking, we have a lot of um, interest having the, these data of a large population and it will dramatically impact how we can science, how we can do research, if we would have access to, to that. But, on the other hand, this can be really a problem if this kind of information leaks and is accessible, because this can, be, can lead to systematic discrimination due to political, ideological, or uh, even um, commercial interest. Maybe the health insurance is not taking my contract, or so I cannot sign a contract because they know I have a certain disease and I have to pay more for that, for example, take another one. And uh, this is kind of questioning our solidarity system. Um, maybe at some point um, people are discriminated because they carry a certain allele of a gene. So in principle, there are good reasons to, to make this data open, but there are also good, a, a bunch of good reasons to not make them open. So we have clearly a, a moral dilemma here. Should we protect individual rights or should we push the scientific progress? And this was mainly for medical data, but clearly this kind of situation is also in, in many other fields. For example, financial data of organizations. Now you, you could do really make interesting research on top of that, but you, the individual um, organization, like a company, might not be interested in sharing this energy consumption of uh, devices, for example. It would be also interesting to engineer devices differently, uh, location data of vehicles, all these kind of um, data from different domains have a similar, um, have the similar problem. They might be very interesting if, if we have a large population where we can have access to, but it brings issues for the individual there or the organization. So how can this be solved? So is there kind of the possibility that we can generate open, ideally open knowledge on closed data? Can we have kind of black boxes that we can not maybe see the, the full data, but that we can at least reproduce if somebody claims something, that we can go back to the same blocked or, or hidden data, run our algorithm and get the same results? Can we maybe train uh, machine learning models on top of that data and use that um, for, for analysis later on? Or at least can we make predictions on top of this closed data that then can be confirmed in different ways? So using this more as a hypothesis generation machinery. How is this done currently? Just an example, Genomics England is a um, stakeholder company that, is, that aims to have 100,000 uh, full human genomes, which is huge. What they do currently, they have closed data centers where only certain people have access to remotely, and they can run their algorithms there and only the results leave this via an airlock. Similar approach is the so-called personal health train. Um, they have these data stations similar to this, so basically data centers where you can push in some algorithms, some or programs actually, and you get some data out. Um, so again, it's, both of them are kind of locked systems and you need, again, as always, you need to trust these instances. And trust is something that is not always well earned. You know, for example, 23andMe, a company that um, brings uh, genome information, SNP sequencing or SNP information to the broad uh, population, and then they sell it. Yeah? So you went there, you just want to know a little bit about your own um, background, and suddenly they sell your, your information to others. Yeah? Once again, this is nothing you can change. If you lose your key, okay. If you lose your bitcoins, okay. This is your damn genome. Yeah? You, you cannot just get it back. Well, there's genome editing, well, but this is something uh, far away. Um, and this is, by the way, not only your genome, this is your, uh, 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 tells a lot about your family as well. Huh? 
So this, is, this has huge implications, and uh, this is a really a cat catastrophe. So there must be better solutions. And there are. So um, I, as I said, with this question in mind, I looked around a little bit and, and tried to understand where, where we stand in respe respect to that. And there are blockchain-based, decentralized uh, data marketplaces that try to exactly um, help here. The promise is that the data owners, so for example, if I sequence my genome, I can put it somewhere, that I have full control about what of that is shared and with whom that is shared. One important thing is also kind of a standardization of data. And um, what the, let's say, the, the people who want to consume the data have is kind of uh, that they can incentivize to get more of their data. And there it becomes already a little bit critical. But in principle, uh, a genome, as I said, if it costs $1,000, this is still too much for many people. But if you put into uh, such a system, into such a marketplace, information about yourself, maybe you have a certain disease, maybe you, you're healthy, I don't know. But if you put this information into that marketplace, um, the data um, consumers can contact you indirectly and tell you, okay, if we get your genome, you will get this and this token that can be later on be traded in, into fiat money. But with this, they can have an incentive or give an incentive to sequence um, certain people or to get more information. It doesn't have to be the genome sequence, as I said. It can be also other stuff. But with this, um, the, the idea is actually to promote this accumulation or this, this collection of data in a standardized way, in an anonymous way, and um, give also the power to the data owner again. And this, to be honest, sounds very interesting. And also um, for pharmaceutical industries, uh, industry, this is very interesting because they can have this traceability again. If they say, okay, we have a bunch of um, um, patients here, we do this and this trial on them, and we get now this wonderful results and we can sell our um, medicine here. But um, under the hood, nobody can prove this. With such a system, they can always say, okay, here's the, the data. If you run your own analysis on top of this, you should get the same results. And this would look then very simply like this. You have the dark, uh, the, the marketplace, um, the, the data owner uh, give access to the data to, to a data consumer and they in, in return get a, get a token, very simply speaking. And still keep, as I said, all the rights, all the um, power over above their own data. There are certain underlying concepts, some of them were mentioned before, fully homophobic encryption is kind of the holy grail in there, and um, as far as I understand, it uh, was not really well implemented so far. Multi-party computation might be a solution, basically you break down the problem into smaller pieces, and an attacker would have to have uh, control over the whole network. Um, they build on certain hardware concepts, uh, trusted execution environments like um, SGX from Intel. Um, there are a lot of uh, these things out there, at least as white papers, um, that are discussing this. And I said this would look very roughly then um, that the, the data consumer asks, for example, for certain data, might find it already in uh, via the blockchain. Um, uh, the, so the data consumer might ask for this, m might find somebody who offers this already, or uh, motivates data owners to contribute their, their data. The data, importantly, is stored um, off-chain, uh, so is, is outside there and is not stored in the blockchain. And then you have these uh, secure compute nodes, such as SGX, for example, and the data owner allows the data consumer to have access to the data, to give it basically into this secure compute node, and only gets, in the end, the results of that computation. So a rather elegant, but also rather complicated system, in my opinion. And there are numerous protocols, providers, that um, have kind of a general purpose solution for this at hand. Ocean Protocol, we will hear in the after, right after me, I guess. Um, Enigma Protocol, they have the concept of secret contracts, basically smart contracts, but in these kind of in encrypted environments or in these uh, trusted environments. Um, the Keaton Protocol from the Oasis Lab and Open Mind, oh, clearly with a focus on machine learning, although I think the Ocean Protocol also has a has a focus on this. So there are different um, potential providers of solutions in, in this perspective, and they are not limited to a certain uh, use case. 
but are rather broad. On the other hand, we also have a kind of more specialized providers coming from, from healthcare, and uh, they come with these kind of concepts. So very elaborate it is already Nebula and uh, Long Genesis. So Nebula has to, be, uh, please keep in mind, this is done by uh, George Church, who is a big driver in this genomic field and um, a strong person in, in that field. Uh, there's also Luna DNA, um, uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce this, uh, PHAROS and uh, encryption. And all of them offer solutions basically that you are not, not, unfortunately not yet offer solutions, but they, they tell that they will offer solutions where you can um, either give health data, health records, or even genomic data. Nebula is even um, working together with a sequencing facility in order to generate the data, to store the data, and uh, then put this into um, the, these private pods that can then be managed via the, the, a blockchain approach. So there are already a lot of people in the boat who offer solutions that sound at least interesting to me. But now the question is, will these data markets, marketplaces really improve our science? And um, I would say maybe, and this has definitely potential. And I said, as a bioinformatician, this is uh, kind of the paradise for me. If, if we have access to this kind of data, this would be really great. And I think it's, it's a trade-off between openness, and I said, I'm, I'm, I'm a very strong open science proponent, and I still always have these debates, and they could be stopped here, because we can say, here's a mode where we um, pay uh, have kind of a trade-off, we pay off a little or leave a little bit of openness away, but in, instead we have access to lots of data and this will um, push our, our knowledge dramatically, in my opinion. But, currently, maybe I'm wrong and I'm very happy if somebody can correct me here, I see only a lot of white papers. And for this, I, I, I could not test anything here. Well, maybe I'm wrong and uh, maybe somebody can do a small demo later. I'm very happy to, to see that. And um, I completely agree that this should not be out too early in this case. Once again, this is basically your, your genome. And unfortunately, the discussion is happening mostly by companies and not academics. So thank you, Zunke, for organizing this because here's a, a strong um, proportion at least from the academic field, and this is important. I see a lot of potential here, and it would be a pity if this is ending up in, in proprietary protocols and proprietary solutions, and we are out of that again. And I mentioned this before, it's good that it's not too early out there in my opinion, because once your genome, or at least snips of that, are out there, you will not get that back. So this is really crucial that we have a rock-solid uh, solution. Yeah, if, in, as I said with Bitcoin, in the worst case, yes, you, you lose maybe a large fraction of your money. But your genome you will never ever uh, can, can, can replace. And if, if you have a disease and, and for whatever reason somebody makes this accessible, and this, this will be out there forever. And also, of, for example, uh, your children or your family, so this can go back in your, uh, in your tree of life in a way. And there are also other issues uh, that uh, even if we have not direct access to, to the data, we can still use certain tools to, well, de-anonymize data. Uh, there is a paper from 2013 where they uh, used certain traits and could uh, link this again to last names. Uh, this is, a, again, a crucial thing and um, it's, it's, it's too precious. And I, I made this rather simple, well, my, my little drawing, how, how this should work. Uh, but the complexity of these systems is dramatic. As I said, you, the, this is a multi-game um, uh, um, solution and you have a multiplayer solution. You have a lot of things to keep in mind here. And it's very complex and this means it might break easily. You might also have problems with different legal systems. Uh, again, um, we had this, I think, several times before. It's, uh, it's clearly it's a global thing, and nobody can uh, forbid me to put data there. Uh, but maybe in the end, I, I have some issues if I want to use the data. And what might be also an issue is that we incentivize now people to, let's say, contribute their genome, but they are actually not aware of these problems. Uh, that they. Um, say, okay, this is good quick money for myself, I, I, I put my genome, I put my, my behavioral data in there, and um, then they 
afterwards recognize that uh, this is a problem, that they cannot get that back. So education is needed, is crucial, as always. Thanks, John, again, um, education is key. And also the data is, as said, stored off-chain. And this is kind of, in my opinion, outsourcing the problem to others, and this has to be solved. Uh, I, I read in one white paper, for example, they suggest to put the genome then on Dropbox. That's ridiculous. Uh, no, this, is, this is the most precious thing. Who would do that? I, I wouldn't, at least. No? Well, and who, who um, makes sure that the claims that people write, for example, in, or put into the blockchain in order to be found by companies incentivizing them, that they are not wrong. If I'm a poor person, I, I, I have depth and I, I know that if I belong to a certain uh, group, my genome is sequenced and I can give this and get money for that. Maybe, maybe I, I lie when I fill out these forms. So this is, in my opinion, not, not clearly solved. Bottom line, this is super promising. As I said, as a bioinformatician, uh, this, this is uh, awesome, having this access to data and in, as I said, as a trade-off between um, openness and privacy. But I think there's still a long way to go, but we should go it. We should try to get it and, and see if this works out for us. So, what are your questions? Thank you very much. Yes, please. Hi, thanks for this uh, presentation. So, I, I, you mentioned this uh, um, in, in the end, these companies like from George Church and so mm -hmm. on. Uh, I'm a bit critical about this uh, and wonder how much this is not creating just new silos because they are actually to my understanding, all ICO-driven uh, projects that just were there when you could still make money with uh, this last year, they were quick, and George Church is always quick. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean that he always has the idea by himself, because mm -hmm. Origin STEM might prove that many of the ideas others had before, but he's very loud. That said, uh, okay, now it's there, but I think just it creates new silos, mm -hmm. and I don't think that this is actually in the interest of the, this movement that we are trying to... Yeah. I completely agree with you, and this is why I also suggest that we academics have to have the discussion, because it's already ongoing there, and um, we, we have the risk that we are outside of this, and this, that this is just a, a big playground for pharmaceutical companies and not for the general public. Yeah. Anyone else? No, we'll keep to good time. Thank you, Conrad. Thank you very much.